And joining us now on the debate in Hamilton, Ontario, Peter Grafe, political scientist at McMaster University. And back here in studio, Ruth Greer, former cabinet minister in that NDP government, and Jerry Kaplan, historian and former NDP strategist. Uh, welcome, everybody, here. It's great to see you again. Nice you don't mind here. my saying, Jerry, Mrs. Greer, she was here for so many years on that other program we used to do. So we never watched a it. special shout out to if, her if, if I, I can. If I wasn't on it, I didn't watch it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Ruth, all right, I'm going to embarrass you a little bit here because, um, well, let's do the fun part first. Okay, want to roll this? Here's 20 years ago today. Roll tape, Michael. I, Bob Ray, swear that I will duly and faithfully, and to the best of my skill and knowledge, execute the powers and trusts reposed in me as Premier and President of the Council and Minister of Intergovernmental Affairs of the Province of Ontario. So help me God. Remember that day? Oh, how can everyone, <laughs> anyone forget it? Yep. It's interesting that when you were watching that interview with Bob, and I asked him, are you bitter about the fact that what you got killed for 20 years ago is conventional wisdom today? And he said, no, 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 no. <laughs> and you muttered under your breath, I'm bitter. How come? Well, because I think so much of what we did was unrecognized um, for its value when we did it, um, was undone by the Harper, ha sorry, the Harris government. I keep getting them confused because, after all, it's all the same players, isn't it? Nicely done. Nicely done. Um, and, you know, the England and Subway that Bob mentioned. I mean, it's just insane to have filled that in and a number of other things that I could go into. So I, I, I'm bitter that there wasn't enough recognition of us when we were there and there isn't enough recognition of the kind of foundation that we laid to build a fairer, more just society. And Jerry, one of the things that Bob also took pains to clarify in his view was the notion that they were unready to govern, that somehow the, the shock of winning the election meant they did not hit the ground running, they just weren't ready to go and, and didn't have a, a strong cabinet in place. Were they ready to govern? Um, it, Ruth seemed to disagree at my reaction to that, and I don't know why, because it's not personal about that. No opposition party is ever ready, ever ready to govern because nobody takes it seriously until it happens. But nobody was less prepared than we, and Bob, his memory is wrong. We didn't know until the last four or five days what was beginning to happen when Peterson started running around the country using red baiting against us. We could tell how frightened he finally was. And we had polls until almost the last day. I actually pushed and got one on the very second last day, showing us at 43%. The vote didn't happen. So on the day before the uh, day of the election, I called David Agnew, the chief of staff, and I said, don't you think we better talk about it? So on the very day before the election, for the first time ever, about eight or nine people met at my house and talked about what would happen if. And then when it happened, to our shock, and the, the seat broke, as Bob said, the 37% gave us this huge majority, on the next day, on the day we won, we had a second meeting at my house, eight, the same eight or nine people figure out what in the world we do now. So there were not weeks of transition planning, oh, so to there speak. Were, there were not hours of transition planning. <laughs> nobody expected it. Nobody did anything. Let me get Peter Grace's view on that. You studied this time. What's your view on how ready uh, the NDP were to take over 20 years ago today? Uh, I'd say not very ready. I mean, they went into the, the campaign, which was a snap election without a platform, and that was cobbled together in the first days of the campaign, from most accounts. Uh, and really, it was a platform that was thrown together from a series, a mishmash of ideas that had some popularity. The party had been working on a new economic uh, strategy and thinking through those years, but the idea was that that would be coming up for a regularly scheduled election. It was at least a year away. So I don't think they were really ready on a programmatic basis. And it didn't help that uh, the Peterson Liberals hadn't done anything to prepare the permanent bureaucracy for a transition. And I think that's a lesson that Bob Ray learned. And so when he was on the way out in 95, he ensured, in fact, that the provincial state was ready for some new government. But without that help on the bureaucratic side, it was then a bit of a question of the, the blind leading the blind, as uh, Jerry Kaplan was just pointing out. On the, the party side, there wasn't much readiness either in terms of how you would take over the reins of the state. Ruth, you, you well, want to take I, I think that's too much of a generalization, with all due respect. And I'm speaking about the area in which I'm most familiar, which was environment. About a year before the actual election happened, Bob called together a group of people, academics, a mixture of people, and we didn't have make much publicity about it, and we met to talk about the environment. Mm -hmm. And we developed a very clear environmental strategy. It so happened that in that election in 90, all of the environmental groups came together, and they put forward to all the parties a clear environmental strategy. At my first meeting with my deputy minister in environment, a 
wonderful man called Gary Posen, he said, uh, Minister, I assume these are your priorities. Laid them out, and in the three or four weeks between the election and the day I walked in as minister, had begun to put together teams to help me determine how to move forward on my issues. Now, I, for a moment, I don't think all ministers had the benefit of both my experience and perhaps that, that level of bureaucracy, but I certainly found the public service in both my ministries as um, exemplary and open right. to whatever. They, they argued with us, but when the decision was made as to what to do, they carried it forward. I want to follow up with Jerry on that because Bob Ray famously uh, did something I don't think any premier had ever done before that, which was to you know, hire as campaign manager as the head of the civil service. So while you may have had a smooth time there, there certainly was the impression that you couldn't, you New Democrats couldn't get your program through because the civil service was frustrating it. So Bob Ray had to appoint his campaign manager and former chief of staff to head up the civil service, that David was, Agnew. That was several years that was into several it. Years later. Uh, well, uh, and I was by, which, characterization by which time there was, great, uh, there was great frustration at, at all levels. Look, it's always been the weakness of social democracy, social democratic socialism is that, as people have said, we're great at redistributing, we're not great at growing the economy. Roy Robineau has made that one of his uh, payons through life, and, and I've never disagreed. None of us, I think, would, would disagree. So first of all, we, weren't re we were ready on the environment because partly we had Ruth, and it was, in a sense, it was easy, the environment. But uh, getting a hold of the economy was very, very difficult. And on top of that, let me stress what Bob said, which is not enough respected, and this was not a word of lie. We had not a clue about the deficit. And not only were we told, only after the election. So all our promises were made, the view that things were just going to be uh, rosy. You're expecting a balanced budget, actually. We're That's expecting what the a balanced budget. That's Peterson and, campaign. And, yeah. and, and a, not only didn't we know, but literally this happened. Every single day for the next 10 days, they came in with a, with a worse number. Somehow, what was bad on, on the second day after we won was worse on the third. And by the 10th, we were drowning already. And well. I, I believe Bruce's government never knew how to get out of it. Let that. me put this to Peter. Peter, this is uh, from Ray Days, the book by Thomas Walcom. It goes like this, little excerpt. Prior to the 1991 budget, Finance Minister Floyd Logren and Premier Bob Ray had called in a group of nine economists for advice. It was clear they already had decided to have some kind of stimulative policy. That's a quote from U of T economist Mel Watkins, one of the participants recalled later. Quote, it was also clear, Treasury seemed to think they were dealing with a short-run recession. Stimulate a bit and then forget it. The suggestion here in this quote, Peter, is that the Ray government's approach to tackling the recession was actually going to be a bit timid. And it turned out, of course, not to be that way at all. What's your recollection of, the, of how that went down? Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't really say that uh, it was too timid. I think the problem was that the, probably starting from this idea that you just need to do a tiny bit of uh, uh, tinkering around the edges, a bit of stimulus, because there was a momentary slowdown, led to the idea that was put out by the, the government that they were really involved in priming the pump. Uh, but in the end, they didn't really do much pr pr uh, pump priming. Uh, most of the additional expenses that pushed the province into a deficit uh, came on programs that were already in place. So you had more unemployed people, you had more social assistance payments on the one hand, and on the other hand, the tax revenues did a, a nosedive due to the slowing of economic activity. So most of the deficit was already accounted for. There wasn't actually much in the way of new programs around that. Maybe just as well, because it would hard, be hard to stimulate the, the economy in one province, especially when uh, Ontario is so export dependent on the United States and was importing some of the American recession in that way too. I think a better strategy from the start would have been to frame it really around a question of supporting Ontarians in hard times and then trying to put together some policies that were branded in that way. Uh, the, the result of making it around stimulus was that it uh, enabled critiques from the political right that were saying that ultimately here was a, a government that was just throwing money out the door without much consideration. All right, let me follow up on that. I'd like me, to get Jerry, go ahead. Nothing that Bob and Ruth and the government would have done would have, would have placated the, co the community that right. jumped in at their throat the moment we won. Which community was that? This was let me, small business, middle business, big business, the police force, and the all the media, all the newspapers on one and one occasion. Wait a second. Wait a second. On Jerry, one occasion, you guys on. were you guys were you, you got elected at thirty seven percent. By Christmas you were at sixty. There was an initial euphoria when the NDP won. Within with in the very first year, Conrad Blackin announced that he would never invest in Ontario. Yeah. 
Barbara Emile called us communists. Diane Francis called us <laughs> communists. The uh, 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 an do you all, remember the billboard downtown? An all, I do remember. Remember whose picture there was? Bob, Bob Ray and Bob, Joseph Stalin together. An, an, something yeah. called the All Business Coalition was already talking about how labor legislation that the government had already repudiated that had been recommended by some labor people was going to cost 450,000 jobs and was going to cost billions of dollars. So are you saying so they, they couldn't have succeeded? The I, times were just we such had that. Another, that. I mean, the other factor, which we haven't talked about, was the federal government trying to deal with its problems by downloading services to the provinces. So we had our own pressures and, and we government. were getting this, you know, coming down the pipe from Fed. But the way he's described it, Ruth, are, are you basically saying if all the stars were lined up against us, there really was no opportunity, given there was a recession as well, for us to succeed. Well, it, was, it certainly made it more difficult. I think we succeeded on a whole number of fronts and that the legacy is there in, in legislation and in attitudes that unfortunately um, haven't prevailed as strongly as I would have liked. Can you say you succeeded when in the ensuing election you went from first place to last place? No, we didn't succeed with the electorate. and. Uh, and, you know, again, it's a dilemma. Do you, do you f go with the wind when you're a government or do you do the kinds of things that you thought were right? And in many cases, we did what was right and perhaps not popular. I think the other thing we failed to do, we were on a learning curve that was sort of like this mm. as cabinet ministers. And we didn't bring our party and our supporters along with us. We neglected to translate back to our, our ridings and our members. But no left-wing government ever has. Doing. Barack Obama has lost his entire constituency because you forget when you're in power all the people who, uh, who, who brought you there. No, you don't take, forget. You, you take, take them, them for, them for granted. granted. And I mean, I, I can think of people whose phone calls got to be returned last because after all, they supported us and they'd understand. And I was trying to placate all of these others that were not our supporters. Let me follow up with Peter on that because Bob Ray did say during our interview he was determined to govern from the center for all the people. He didn't want to be the union's premier, he wanted to be the premier of everybody. Uh, in the end, uh, you know, there's that old expression, you got to dance with the one that brung you. Did he forget about that? Uh, I mean, I guess there's many who have criticized him on that grounds, but uh, I think it's kind of it takes two sides to it. On the one hand, uh, I suspect that as uh, Ruth has just pointed out, there's a tendency to try to govern uh, to ensure that those who might not necessarily be inside the tent uh, are comfortable with your government and to move to the centre. But on the other hand, there were a lot of social movements in the labour movement in Ontario who kind of sat back and expected the government to deliver uh, without showing forms of social support for particular programmes or initiatives. And so in maintaining a role that was often critical of the government but not necessarily supporting measures that were useful for it, uh, there was a breakdown on that side too. So uh, there's a lot of sort of bad blood to this day, I think, between elements of the organized left and the NDP. And I think a lot of it on both sides comes from a, a lack of thinking about how they could work together strategically in government. It's a lot easier when in opposition. Ruth, I want you to get us inside those cabinet meetings to the extent you can. I know you take oaths of not spilling beans and all that, but help us understand a bit how Bob Ray ran cabinet meetings. You know, was he George W. Bush on the decider? Oh, no. He wasn't. No, he was extremely democratic. I mean, we had a structure, we had a policy and, pri policy and priorities committee, we had other issue committees that came forward. Um, he, didn't like, he didn't like cabinet ministers to disagree over issues. I had a, a, a fairly major disagreement with one of my colleagues and was told on a number of occasions, don't bring that to the table go back and sort it out and then come. But I have certainly seen um, occasions when the cabinet uh, disagreed with Bob and, and Bob you know, uh, was overruled he by his down. cabinet and, and you know, positions changed or where we worked. It was a, it was a very uh, rewarding and, and worthwhile experience. But it was and also, I think he was a fabulous premier. It was also, uh, because my wife was in the office of the premier and so she went to a lot of cabinet ministers, it was exhausting and debilitating beyond words, especially in the first year or so. How, how they so? met for hours and hours and hours <laughs> trying to get their act together. And I kept asking Carol, when are they going to decide, and when are they going to do anything since they're so busy meeting trying to decide what to do that they haven't got time to do anything. And I think by the time they got themselves out of that period, uh, a whole lot of them were exhausted. Is that true, Ruth? I wouldn't go quite that far, but we certainly did a lot more outreach and trying to connect with people and trying to meet with people and get all the various views before we came to a decision that um, other governments probably wouldn't bother to do. I'm not sure that it was wrong, but we certainly were very tired. And you realize that five years, unfortunately,
is a very short period. And if you want a, um, home care, long-term care, which was one of my issues when I got to health and the Francis Lankin wrestled with before me, we didn't have a plan as to how to do it. We knew we wanted to do it. And so we probably spent two and a half years consulting, discussing, and then didn't have time to put it in place um, significantly enough that it stuck after we went. And so a lot of things could be undone. And I, that's just one example. Let me try this with Peter then. As you look back on this time 20 years later, what successes do you think the NDP are entitled to look back at and say, we got this right, and it was good for the province, and it stood the test of time? Well, I think on a level of concrete policies, uh, you're really looking at uh, some fairly discrete measures in areas such as education. Uh, I mean, certainly in terms of dealing with the recession, the investment in training and in childcare was really significant in preparing uh, Ontario uh, for the subsequent boom. Uh, and also at the level of public finances, uh, Ultimately, while the NDP is often seen as being spendthrift and, and not able to manage the candy shop, if you like, uh, had uh, sort of levels of taxation and spending remained on their courses, Ontario would have balanced its budget by the late 90s and not be in as quite a tight situation as it is now. I mean, the, the problem, I think, was cutting taxes too soon into the recovery uh, under the next government. So I think there's some things there which are useful, and then bigger picture things of actually addressing significant issues as public issues, whether it's our poor productivity performance, a poor labor market training performance, uh, the need for child care in an economy where 70% of children, sorry, 70% of, of mothers with children under five are working. Those kinds of issues being dealt with as public issues rather than as things for individuals or firms to deal with privately was an important uh, marker. Uh, and I think slowly we see those coming back onto the, the radar of the McGuinty government after 15 years of neglect uh, as issues requiring some sort of collective solution. Okay, let there, me, are let me add a there, are there are political lessons. The lessons is if you go too far uh, to, uh, to make the establishment unhappy, uh, you will get your head cut off. Uh, the landlords of Toronto put an ad in the Wall Street Journal asking Americans not to invest in, Ontar in socialist Ontario. These things went on. We forget. There was a very Ontario coup going on. There was a capital strike going on. Uh, and that's what happens. And so when Harris came in and dismantled, as much as he possibly could of the entire uh, Ray legacy, uh, he got away with it much more easily than we could get away with reestablishing it. And that's why, sorry, and that's why uh, Mr. Who was No, I agree. I mean, I was, I was, going, to, I was going to remark on some of the, the Regulated Health Professions Act had been underway for about 10 years. And I remember when we finally got it passed, there were eight health ministers at the celebration because they'd all had their hands on it all through the years. But I mean, legalizing nurse practitioners. And there were doctors who took out ads saying, how could you trust a health minister who saw a nurse practitioner? And not a doctor. Um, midwives, you know, I never go out and make talks about health care, but somebody doesn't say, thank you, my profession exists because of what your government did. Pay equity, 400,000 women who saw their salaries increase as a result of our pay equity. Actually, so there's a whole, you know, graduated licensing for mm -hmm. young people. I mean, there's all sorts of initiatives out there that are taken for granted now I was gonna that raise came another out one. of our government. I was going to raise another one. If you ask people who's the first premier in the 1990s to cut taxes, everybody would say Mike Harris. You, as the former health minister, would remember it was actually Bob Ray. You cut the employer health tax. I don't know if you know that. I'd remember that. that. <laughs> you guys cut taxes first. At what point, you know, obviously uh, in the midterm, most governments go into a dip, right? I mean, Dalton McGuinty today is 11 points behind Tim Hudak if the last poll is to be believed. At what point, Ruth, did you look at the polls, see that you were down, and come to the final conclusion that, you know what, we aren't coming back? It's just too high a hill to climb. Come on, you're talking to an Irish optimist, <laughs> a pessimist who never thought we'd get elected, and mm. certainly someone who I mean, never looked beyond what we were doing. I mean, it was partially, we were so busy, you looked beyond next week, you were, it was too much. But I don't, I don't remember worrying about not being back, um, perhaps I should have. But essentially, we had things we wanted to accomplish. And we kept on working to try to build that better society that many of us had spent our adult lives um, seeking to create. Jerry, did you think a comeback was possible, re-election was possible? The, uh, I guess Ruth forgets, but which, or we have different memories. Uh, the government barely met uh, the legislature in its fifth year. It, it didn't uh, at all. It didn't at all. It didn't call the legislature back in 95. And even though we went on for months and months. It was, she does remember that. It she was just very, didn't want to say it. It was very no, dispirited. I, <laughs> I, I, had, I had written the strategy paper for the 90 campaign when the party had, when they, the election committee simply couldn't do one. They asked me and I did it. And so I did another one for 95 in which I said, 
the re it's what Bob said, the recession is over. We actually have a real opportunity here, and we've done some enormously important economic things, the things that, the things that our government is least recognized for, go out and run a campaign about who in fact can, can tackle the economy best. And they didn't, they didn't have the, 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 the energy even to do that, and Bob ran a very dispirited final campaign. Didn't give anybody any reason to, to vote for him again because he didn't expect they would. Last couple of minutes here, I want to touch on this. I, I, uh, this is behind the scenes stuff I don't usually share, but what the heck. We invited the four MPPs, your colleagues, who were in the House back then and who are still in the House today to join this gathering. Uh, Gilles Bisson, Howard Hampton, Peter Cormos, Rosario Marchese. They all declined our invitation. How weird. From what I'm told, Bob Ray's picture no longer hangs in the NDP caucus room at Queen's Park. Um, <laughs> what's going on here, Ruth? I have no idea, and I, I don't think I want to know. And I, them, some of them are not here because they're in their writings and their other events. We so have I studios don't know, in their writings. I don't know what the re issue for that is. I think that they were certainly affected by the battering of our reputation and what the government talk and you know, took and the criticism that was there. Um, I wasn't in the legislature through the Mike Harris years, and I can't imagine um, how dispiriting and discouraging that must have been. But um, I think the time will tell, and if the book is ever written, that we were a government that did our best as we could in very difficult times and left a foundation of some things that um, have improved this promise. We give 30 to Jerry and 30 to Peter. I think they just didn't want to take time away from me and Ruth as we could reminisce about all this. And <laughs> I'm, very great, I'm very grateful to them. Other than that, it's inexplicable and the most bizarre thing I've ever heard. Peter, it does, uh, I'm not sure this is the right word, but, but do those five years still haunt the NDP today? I think they definitely do. Uh, there was an aspect of success and power there that it was interesting to the party. Uh, but at the same time, when the defeat came, it was really uh, damning, and it was hard for them to figure about where to go. And, and the, uh, the answer recently has been really to run very populist campaigns, but not necessarily to project the aura that you could be a government in waiting. So I think it's a party that still has a tough time making sense of that period. There's some pride in what was accomplished. But at the same time, especially with Bob Ray writing books where he seemed to be saying members of the party were out of touch with the modern reality, uh, where there is also a sense of... Uh, of disquiet uh, with that leadership, and so I'm not surprised that people don't come out. On one hand, a sense of pride, but another sense, uh, a certain feeling of betrayal of, of where Bob Ray went subsequently. Peter, you get the last word. Thanks for being there on the line for us from the Hammer. We appreciate it. Peter Grafe, the political scientist from McMaster University. Ruth Greer, the former cabinet minister. Jerry Kaplan, former strategist for the NDP in those back rooms. Happy anniversary, Ruth. Thank 20 you. 20 years ago today. That 20 was years ago today. Hello, day for you, wasn't a it? Quiet, a quiet, confident morning. I, cri <laughs> I cried my eyes out. <laughs>